I'm still kind of on the fence. Like I say that I'm like ready for it and then I'm on the, then I'm like, mm, and then I am and then I'm not. So I want to see what it's all about. Yeah, I think Dr. Katzen can help us make our decision. Yeah, yeah I think so sure. too. Yeah, so, you know, being ready is all up here as a patient, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, entirely up here. So um, surgically, medically as a doctor, being ready means your weight should be stable for like a good three months. Okay. Mm. Okay. So we just got our blood work done. Yeah, we did. And our doctors asked us, what are we doing to have such great blood work? Yeah. And you know what we told them? Procare. Pro oh my goodness. Yeah. We told them like, yeah, we take Procare every day because they have a multivitamin that you can just take one a day. Yes, exactly. They have a capsule and a chewable form. And not only do they have vitamins, but they also have calcium, calcium chews. chews. Oh my God, they're so good. They're so delicious. It's like our own little sweet treat for the end of the night. It really is because they have the dark chocolate and they have the cinnamon roll. Yes, and I love the salted caramel and the dinner mint. All righty, we'll go to ProCareNow.com and use code OSLP at checkout to save some money. You guys ask us all the time, what is our favorite protein powder? Yeah, literally we see this question every day. And the answer is always devotion. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I even use it this morning to make my own sweet treat for nighttime because it's just a, a brownie batter pudding. And you literally just use one scoop and then milk or water. And then I use it every morning in my profi. It's so delicious. Oh my God. I want one right now thinking of it. Seriously, it's 20 grams of protein. So go get yours now at devotionnutrition.com and use code OSLP to save some money. Welcome back, OSLP family. Yeah. Welcome, welcome. You are listening to our Sleep Life podcast, and this is Kelly. This is Maho. And as always, we like to do a little housekeeping in the front of our episodes. That's right. And we are super excited because we have announced and started everything for our most recent <laughs> endeavor. Yeah. Um, which is our Just Be You Bariatric Award Show. It is the first ever, ever of its kind. Mm -hmm. um, we have no other award shows in our bariatric community and we were like why not yeah we need to celebrate these people yes and there's so many inspiring people that are out in our community and we need your help so yes. if you can go over to our sleeve life podcast.com click over to that little award show just be you mm -hmm. award show tab um it, if you're on a computer it's up at the top if you are on your phone a mobile device it is the three lines up in the right hand corner yes it is um so stop what you're doing pause us go over there click the award show the nominations are open they will stay open until the end of june so yes. we have two months um and then Tickets actually go on sale June 1st. They do. Those I do. can't believe it. But June 1st, we are going to do the tickets for the show. Yeah. And it's going to be in our backyard. I know. It's going to be in Portland, Oregon at the Aladdin Theater. We're mm -hmm. super stoked because, like, I've seen comedians there. So I'm like, oh, my God, we get to be on stage <laughs> with, the place, pe with people that I've seen here before. Yes. This is crazy. Yes. And we are so. going to, in true OSLP fashion, yeah. we are not going to do a red carpet because <laughs> we are going to do a pink carpet. Mm -hmm. So everybody gets to walk the pink carpet and mm -hmm. we're going to have photographers there. That's so everybody right. gets photos. It's going to be. I just can't believe that it's gonna we be are one, actually getting to do it. One of a kind. And wear what you want to wear. Yes. Like, Pink punk rock show slash award show. Yeah, that's right. It had a baby. This is what it'd be. So, <laughs> yes. I'm already planning my outfit. I know Mel's already thinking about hers. I am. Um, so, yeah. So that is going to be um, November 12th. So make sure you're getting your nominations in. Voting will start um, in three months. Yep. So just keep it. Well, and share it as much as you can. Yeah, because, share, share, share. Because this was kind of my brainchild. And the reason why I wanted to do this, too, was because, like, people say... All people hear about is the bad things about yes, bariatric surgery. 100%. All we hear about is the worst case scenarios. And it's like, well, yeah, they don't fucking know we're here. Yeah. So how about we have a big award show to say, hey, we're fucking here. We're and not we going anywhere. It. And we're killing it. Stop lying to people about it yes. being like the worst thing ever. Yes. So, so that annoying. is coming up and we are so excited. Yeah. And then if you want to help support us, go over to patreon.com forward slash OSLP, where yes. we have the world's best support group. Yes. It is called the Winner's Bench 
lunch. We mm-hmm. like to call them our benchies. Um, and our benchy group is one of a kind also. Yeah. And if you do just the, like us, if you do the $10 tier, you automatically are in the benchies and then you get your own episodes that are just for patrons. It is called the That's What She Said Corner. That's right. Because and, that's what I say. <laughs> yeah, and we video record all of our episodes. Mm-hmm. So like the one that we're doing right now that we get to introduce someone's very special. Yes. You guys get that video 10 days early. Yes. So go over there and get the $10 tier because you get all mm-hmm. of the perks that come along yep. with it. And then if you want a free way to support us, you need to go to YouTube. Yes. On your phone. Just click Preloaded. on the damn thing and literally <laughs> write our Sleeve Life podcast. We are the only ones. Yes. So click on that. Subscribe the bell. And it means more to us than it means to you. So go ahead and do that right now. And then and without further ado, do, let's have Dr. Katzen join us. Yeah. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, This is very, very exciting. Uh, I wish I could go to your uh, show up in uh, Portland. That sounds amazing. Yes. Well, you're invited. You're invited. You are definitely. (laughs) Well, thank you. We would love to have you. (laughs) Yes, yes. Yeah. We we are so excited to have you on this episode. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure. And, um, you know, we sort of do the same thing, really. Mm -hmm. Um, I do a lot of uh, reconstructive plastic surgery Mm -hmm. after weight loss. I've been doing it for about 22 years. I love my patients, love the uh, extreme results we get and uh, have had, you know, thousands and thousands of very happy patients. Yay. That's what we love to hear. We actually met you at the WLSFA in Las Vegas. Yes. That was a great conference. And yeah, so it's good. Yes, yes. And we were like, um, hey, we need to have you on because you're yeah. awesome. Well, and the fact that you deal with extreme weight loss patients yes. is the biggest key there because what we've learned prior is that the skin's different mm-hmm. with people that Absolutely. have. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit yeah, more? Can you go into detail about, you know, our skin and the weight loss and how that all works? Yeah. So um, weight loss patients are different in many, many ways. And you've got to imagine the skin sort of as its own entity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the skin's been stretched out with weight gain. Mm -hmm. Then with weight loss, the skin recoils. It tries to bounce back as much as it can. Okay. But it can't a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's maybe not just one weight loss episode. Maybe it's weight loss times 20 up Mm -hmm. and down, up and down, up and down. Mm -hmm. So that skin's going, what is going on? And it can't bounce back. Mm -hmm. So my patients are often left with this skin that just doesn't bounce back. Mm -hmm. So as a surgeon, you know, starting out about 20, 25 years ago, I would pull and tug and pull and I'd get patients back and they're like, you should have taken more. I'm like, oh man, I pulled it as tight as I can. And then I've just found that over the years, you've got to pull it much, much tighter than you think. Ah. So inexperienced plastic surgeons that don't deal with weight loss patients every single day don't know that weight loss patients really need to be pulled even tighter than you can possibly imagine. Wow. I did not know that. Not just sort of a couple of layers of sutures either. Right now we're doing six layers of stitches to keep everything nice and tight. Holy crap. It's not just one little pretty layer on the top because that's going to bust open because of the tension involved. Um, And a lot of plastic surgeons who don't deal with weight loss patients don't really understand that. Okay. Oh, I did not know that. No, not at all. Six layers of stitches. Yeah. Yeah, Six layers of stitches. And then also you've got to realize too, it's the skin. Yeah, we take care of that. Mm -hmm. It's the fat. Well, a lot of the fat has been taken care of with weight loss. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, you've lost the weight and most of that weight really is fat. So when we're doing plastic surgery, most of the fat is gone. But okay. then a third layer is the muscle. The muscles, okay. and we're talking about the tummy, the rectus diastasis, the six pack muscle. A lot of the time with weight gain, the tummy has been stretched out mm-hmm. because of the fat around the intestines. That muscle has been stretched out. So almost 99.9999999% of the time, we are stitching the muscles, stitching the six pack on males and females to get that tummy nice and flat. Oh. And even at that conference in Vegas, I saw a patient who was about 20 years out from her body lift. And I asked her, is your tummy still tight? She goes, yep, super tight. That's 20 years out. That's amazing. Wow. 
And that's because of the muscle tightening that we did surgically and her dedication, you know, to continued weight loss and Mm -hmm. eating right and exercising. Mm -hmm. So it it all goes together. So you got to understand weight loss patients are a very different type of patient Mm -hmm. and you've got to treat them um, in a different fashion, much more Mm -hmm. aggressively in terms of the typical maybe nip tuck that you would traditionally see maybe in Beverly Hills. Yeah. Mm, Okay. Well, well, what, um, what made you go into this field? Yeah. Really good question. It boils down to one patient. Oh, and now one patient came, walked in my door about 22 years ago and she was a neurosurgery ICU nurse, charge nurse. Wow. That means hardcore. So this, this nurse takes care of like the sickest patients, in my opinion, in the hospital, brain trauma, Mm -hmm. you know, head trauma, brain surgery, brain tumors, those kinds of patients that are extremely sick. And she's in charge of taking care of those patients and the nurses at a very, very reputable level one trauma center here in in Los Angeles. Okay. And she had lost over 400 pounds. Whoa. Okay. Holy and she shit. had gone all over Los Angeles, all over Beverly Hills. She told me she saw over 20 plastic surgeons and every one of them said, oh, you know, lose more weight. Your BMI is too high. Oh, you know, you have too much skin. It's going to leave too bad scars. You're going to need multiple surgeries. It's not going to look good. One excuse after one excuse wow. after one excuse. She saw me and I'm like, look, congratulations on losing all that weight. That's amazing. Your BMI is not less than 30, but that doesn't matter. We're going to have to do multiple surgeries, Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, you're going to look fantastic. So we did a 360 circumferential lower body lift. A couple of months later, bilateral thigh lift, thigh reduction, incision from the groin to the knee. A couple of months later, breast lift, breast augmentation. A couple of months later, arms and facelift. Damn. She looks fantastic. Oh. Now she does and is nationally ranked a ballroom dancer. You know, she completes on the ballroom dancing. That's so cool. Oh my God. I want to meet this lady. Yeah. Amazing patient, amazing woman, amazing nurse, amazing story. And then from that patient, you know, she told me, look, it's not just me. There are a lot of other patients mm-hmm. in this same predicament yeah. that have lost a lot of weight. There are not many experts in this field. No. And if you like it, do it. And I love it because of the patients, highly motivated. And for me, on the table, you see their after result right away. Mm. Kind of unfortunate that we see it before the patient <laughs> sees it, but immediate gratification on the table. There it is. There's what we've taken off. Oh, so wow. For me, extremely satisfying. For the patient, extremely satisfying. Yeah, they're big surgeries. Yeah, they're bigger risks. Yeah, they're bigger complications. But just like you said, we should be celebrating the beneficial portions of the surgery, not that, oh my God, what could happen? Exactly. Yes. yes. Exactly. I love yeah. that. Oh that is God. so, so is that, cool. Yeah. So is that one patient? And now we've done, you know, tens of thousands of surgeries and weight loss patients. So yeah. So it's a very rewarding field. Yes. There's nothing like when people get their life back mm-hmm. and being to be being able to be a part of that is yeah. like it gives it I say it all the time but it gives me chills like mm-hmm. goosebumps yeah. like goosebumps like knowing that those people are out there and they're so inspiring and they're so in their new journeys and you just get to be a small part of it mm-hmm. makes it all worth it seriously cuz yes. like anytime we get a message and they say those things to you I'm mm-hmm. like oh yeah thank you yeah. it's working They'll be like I'm supported because of you guys I was prepared because of you guys and it's like oh my uh, gosh I, we're doing our job we're doing our job and I'm I'm sure you feel like that too because you're actually fixing the outer portion of it and Absolutely. it's yeah. so that's the part that kind of I think messes with people's heads is they you know they've lost 150 pounds but there's this big belly skin that's hanging over and so they still can't wear the clothes they want to wear right because that gets in the way mm-hmm. yep. yep. Is, and uh our sort of uh practice one of our practice slogans is complete the journey oh you know you, know, you lose the weight that's all fine and good but unfortunately, a lot of the media doesn't really tell you about part two. It's great you lost the weight, but now you're left with a lot of redundant skin mm-hmm. in areas you may not have imagined. Mm-hmm. And people don't tell you, oh, yeah, that's just part one. Now you need part two 
which is the plastic surgery afterwards. Yeah. So, so can you tell us how a weight loss surgery patient would actually start the process of getting plastics? Yeah. So very good. So great question. That's probably maybe the most important question. So, oh. uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Good job, I, always, <laughs> I always encourage patients to lose as much weight as they possibly can. Okay. You know, okay. Eat right, exercise, and then whatever kind of gastric surgery you've had, whatever kind of diet plan you've had, your body's going to plateau. Mm -hmm. You know, you can eat one green pea a day and exercise 30 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Your body is still just going to do what it can do. And it plateaus out. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, I hate these insurance companies that say, oh, your BMI has to be less than 30. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't take patients into account. Right. Okay. They don't deal with patients day to day like I do. Mm -hmm. All right. So the um, BMI is important, but it's just a solitary number based on your height and weight. It has nothing to do with your medical health or your weight loss history. Right. Okay. So lose the weight. And then once your weight has been stable for about three months, okay. then start to look to plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. And with plastic surgery, basically we have a checkoff list in the office. What areas bother you? Mm -hmm. And we have some patients who circle all 20 items. We have some patients that check off one or two. And me, fortunately, I'm so busy. I just do areas that bother you the most. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have some patients that walk in the door that only their tummy bothers them, mm -hmm. or maybe their arms only bother them, or mm -hmm. maybe their face or their neck only bothers them. Mm -hmm. And we focus just on that one area. Mm -hmm. But in most weight loss patients, a lot of areas bother them. Yeah. So then we go one by one. Okay. What area bothers you the most? Oh, the tummy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you may need typically a tummy tuck mm -hmm. or maybe you need an extended tummy tuck. Okay. Do your hips bother you? Well, yeah. Okay. So then we continue our tummy tuck incision a little bit around the hips. Mm -hmm. Well, does your buttock bother you? Well, come to mention it. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. So now we've converted that tummy tuck into a hip lift and even into a body lift. Wow. Okay. So we've established that one surgery. Mm -hmm. And then if the patient's healthy, we can think about, can we do other procedures with that body lift? Uh -huh. Well, do your thighs bother you? Well, come to think of it, they do. Mm -hmm. So that often we can combine the thigh lift with the body lift. Mm -hmm. Okay. If your thighs don't bother you, maybe the breast and the arms bother you. And maybe we're combining the breast and the arm surgery with the body lift. So we try to maximize these surgeries as safely as we can into one surgery. Mm -hmm. And then part two, we do the areas further down on the wish list. Maybe okay. you hadn't thought about, or maybe your tummy bothers you more than the breast of the arms. So we do the tummy first. Okay. All right. But typically I'd say 95% of the time we're doing lower body first, tummy tuck, body lift and thighs come back one or two months later for upper body breast augmentation, usually implants okay. plus minus usually with a lift. And then the arm reduction, arm lift. Okay. Is there a max that you allow per time? Depends on the patient. Okay. Uh, depends on the patient. Um, it, you know, some body lifts take me, I think the fastest I've done a body lift is four hours. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's the fastest in 22 years I've done. Yeah. She had everything done. She looks spectacular, but she was on the smaller side. Okay. 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 I've done some extended tummy tucks, which took me 14 hours. Wow. And that was just the tummy tuck. That was just the front side. What's Hernia, a, a lot of excess skin, and it just sort of depends on the patient. So what's an extended tummy tuck? Like what's the ah, difference? Ah, really good question. <laughs> so it's it's a what's it's a bad term. It's sort of like this 360 sorry, 360 lipo and mommy makeover. Oh. And these are uh, loose terms that are thrown out there. Extended tummy tuck means we're doing a tummy tuck, but the incision is a little bit longer than usual. Okay. okay. Well, what's usual? <laughs> for some plastic surgeon, the usual tummy tuck's about, you know, three or four inches. Okay. For me, my extended tummy tucks, for me, my definition is we go, when you're laying down, I go from the table the corner where your tummy hits the side of the table all the way across to the other side of the operating room table oh. to get your tummy out. Uh -huh. That to me is an extended tummy tuck. Okay. okay. For other plastic surgeons, it may be anywhere between that maximum to even less of a distance for your tummy tuck. Okay. 
All right. All right. And then so extended tummy tuck really depends on your plastic surgeon's definition of what their definition of an extended tummy tuck is. Got it. Okay. All right. And then do you always do lipo with it or is that something? It really depends on the patient. Okay. So if they have excess fat, maybe we're doing some lipo. Okay. And typically when we do lipo on a tummy tuck, we're doing it of the love handles. Okay. okay. Of the hip region. Yeah. And the reason we do that is because of blood supply. We'd like to do lipo on the tummy, but the f- skin can die just above the pubic region if you do a lot of liposuction on the tummy portion of uh-huh. a tummy tuck. Uh-huh. So that's why we typically just do lipo on the love handle region. Okay. Well, that's where I would want it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say no to that. No, nope. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. yeah uh, so we often combine the uh, liposuction of the love handles, the hips with the tummy tuck um, for just added contour. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you want to be in like top physical shape when you're yeah, getting, ideally. Okay. I mean, you don't have to be running triathlons and, you know, you know, BMI of 20 and, you know, you know, 9% body fat. No, no. You just want to be eating right, exercising, doing a little bit above your normal routine in terms of exercise. Okay. Uh, be, and you want to try to build up maybe a little bit more muscle bulk than you usually do. Awesome. Cause in your healing process, the first thing the body burns up in terms of energy is muscle. Oh, yes. Okay. It hits the muscle first. And then once it's sick of muscle, then it goes towards the fat. Okay. Now, yeah. if you have any pre um, conditions like, like Kelly has lupus and like rheumatoid arthritis and things like that. Does that play a factor into healing or even making a decision to have plastics? Yes, it does. Now okay. medical conditions are very important. Everyone's individual. So mm-hmm. we always get questions from, you know, we asked, we had a patient the other day, she had sickle cell anemia. Okay. Can we do surgery? Well, Oof. possible. I've had previous blood clots. Can we do surgery? Well, possible. Um, you know, I've had cancer, possible radiation. So everyone's individual. That's what the consultation's all about. Right. So we'll figure out those factors. So rheumatoid arthritis, not a contraindication. A okay. lot of my patients have rheumatoid arthritis. Perhaps rheumatoid arthritis got so bad, you couldn't exercise, your joints are all stiff. Right. You wound up in bed and gained weight, had the gastric bypass, lost the weight. Yep. So a lot of patients have rheumatoid arthritis. Lupus, a lot of patients have lupus. Mm-hmm. Some patients have the lupus, they're given so much steroid mm-hmm. that it causes obesity, weight gain, yeah. that they have to have a gastric bypass, lose the weight, they still have the lupus, but they're off the steroids. So we're still operating on those patients. So okay. everybody is individual, but majority of the time, the patients that come to my office for weight loss, sorry, for plastic surgery after weight loss can have these surgeries. It's rare that we're turning down patients. Okay. Awesome. And fibromyalgia goes in with that. Like, yeah. Okay. So fibromyalgia is a tricky one. Okay? okay. So fibromyalgia is one of those diseases doctors still don't really have a good handle on. Yeah. Um, we'll get there. I'm very confident Mm -hmm. But with fibromyalgia. Again, my job as a plastic surgeon is to get rid of skin, get rid of fat, tighten up the muscle. Mm -hmm. That's all good. Pain postoperatively is a very individual thing. Pain Mm -hmm. is all up here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've done some of these extreme makeovers on men and women that after the surgery, I kid you not, they just take one or two Tylenol. And I'm like, what? That's amazing. I feel like that versus would be me. The majority, <laughs> versus the majority of us who are taking pain medications for maybe a good three to four weeks after the surgery, sometimes six to eight weeks. It really depends on the patient. Okay. Uh, what so, kind of pain meds are just, are prescribed? Yeah. I give Percocet 10s, okay, because okay. that's one of the strongest uh, narcotic pills, okay? okay? It doesn't cause bleeding, Okay. And one of the factors is with the stomach that's been altered surgically, sleeve, ruined my gastric bypass, uh, other kind of stapling, gastrectomy is the lap band. We don't know pharmacologically the absorption spectrum of Percocet 10s. Okay. So you'll get these pharmacists that I get on the phone with, oh, this is way too much medication. I'm like, well, no, it isn't because we don't know the numbers on what percentage of pain medication is absorbed on weight loss patients? Right. Wow. Some, you know, sleeve patients, you know, it's a different kind of length on the stomach. 
Roux & Y patients, they have a different length on their small bowel. So it really, nobody knows the numbers. So pain, we treat very subjectively. So between okay. the three of us and our audience, everybody's interpretation of pain is different. Right. I'll give you what you need, but the majority of the time, the pain can be controlled with these Percocet tens. Good to awesome. know. Yeah, awesome. I have a very, very high pain tolerance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so because because I have fibro arthritis and I have lupus, I've yeah. been through it all pain wise. Mm-hmm. So yeah. there's some days where I take uh, ibuprofen and I'm totally good. And yeah. then there's other days that I would need something stronger. But I do like I I can tolerate more than the average person, oh, I would 100%. say. 100%. <laughs> I feel like a baby yeah. next to you. <laughs> <laughs> Even yeah. though I have a pretty good high tolerance too, I'm just like, damn, that's insane. I go through a lot. Yeah, I go through a lot. Yeah, so the perfect, you know, perfect example right there. I mean, between the three of us, we have three different complete spectrums of pain and pain control. Mm-hmm. Um, so your experience of pain is totally different. Okay. A couple of other things I do, which are unique, I use a pain pump for okay. almost all procedures we do. A pain pump drips in a local anesthetic. A local anesthetic is the one I use is lidocaine. Okay. Sometimes we also use Marcaine. Mm-hmm. You may know them when you go to the dentist and get mm-hmm. Novocaine injected. Mm-hmm. They inject it, it becomes numb. I use this little, it's called an on cue pain pump. It drips in pain medication on the surgical field. Uh-huh. Again, it numbs the area. So again, less narcotics are all better and better pain control is always better for these patients. Ooh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fun fact about me is I used to work in a dental office. So when mm-hmm. you're saying that, I'm like, oh, I know exactly what those are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. I'm so, like, I used to pay, I pass that. I would, I load it and pass yeah. it over. I don't even know if yeah. I could pass. Uh, anyways, it's been a while. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, less pain is always better. Yes. Any way we can deliver it, uh, it, it is is best. Okay. Well, what does recovery look like for someone? Yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah, so every procedure has its own little, you know, recovery period. Right. Uh, so of the procedures, let's do tummy tuck. Right. So tummy tuck typically takes me about three to four hours to perform. Almost everything I do is general anesthesia. Okay. This is the year 2022. Why try things under local and twilight anesthesia? One, it's extremely painful. Mm-hmm. And two, it's a little bit more dangerous. I'll go on the record, more dangerous mm. than general anesthesia. Okay. Okay. And my anesthesiologist will vouch for that. Okay. okay. But uh, so pretty much everything I do is under general anesthesia with a board certified MD doctor anesthesiologist. So that's perfect. So recovery period on a tummy tuck is looking like maybe at about two or three weeks. Okay. Pretty much don't want you working kind of laying low. With okay. the body lift, which goes all the way around, it's tummy tuck, hip lift, and buttock lift all in one surgery. Some people call it a belt abdominal plastic because it's like a belt. It goes all the way around. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Recovery on that is going to be about maybe two to three weeks. Oh. All right. The thigh lift incision typically from the groin to the knee, excess skin and fat. Typically, recovery is going to be maybe about two to three to four weeks, depending on what kind of activity you do. Okay. Okay. Rest rest is usually maybe about 10 days. Arms are usually maybe about one to two weeks. Face is usually about maybe one to two weeks. Okay. And then you are for return to mostly sitting jobs, sedentary jobs. Now, if you have a job where you're working at maybe Home Depot or Lowe's or one of those, and you're stacking stuff. Mm-hmm. Or I have a lot of patients who work for Amazon okay. and they're stacking and you know putting stuff on the shelves. That's pretty high intense, physically demanding. So for those kinds of jobs, give yourself more time, like okay. a month, six weeks, maybe even eight weeks, depending on your recovery. Okay. okay. And what kind of items should they have at home? Oh yeah, good. So Haley is working on this. We oh. are going to have, uh, on our website, we have a whole list of things you can buy and purchase to make your recovery easier, mm. typically from our greatest vendor, Amazon. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I love Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. So basically for like a tummy tuck, there'll be things which make it easier. There'll mm. be an abdominal binder that we're going to suggest and you're going to wake up on. There'll be those alligator clamps. Like if you drop something on the floor alligator clamp to the rescue. You can pick it up off the floor. Nice. There'll be some creams that we suggest to optimize the scar. There'll okay. be some silicone strips, again, optimizing the scar. One of the best things you can get for yourself for a tummy tuck and or even a body lift and a thigh lift is going to be uh, a recliner with those power ejector buttons. 
Oh yeah, that okay. like kind of ejects you up. Oh, exactly. I was like, what is he talking so, about? <laughs> a little button on the side, so you push the little button, and the chair takes you from a sitting position to a standing position. Gotcha. So the chair does all the work. You don't have to pull yourself out of bed. The person taking care of you doesn't have to worry that they're going to rip and tear anything when they pull you out of the bed. And uh, that's a really, really probably, if you're not going to get anything else, get that thing. You can okay. rent them. You don't have to buy them. Oh, uh, oh. Here in LA, there's a place that rents them by the day. Oh. There's also a place that rents them by the week. Uh, but, you know, if you want a new piece of furniture, that's a good piece of furniture to get. Too. All so right. You can, yeah. So well, that's good. Well, and sh- it sounds like we should have someone at the house helping. I would. It okay. makes it a lot easier. You know, it doesn't have to be a uh, board certified plastic surgeon in your living room all the time. <laughs> it doesn't have to be even a nurse, but something, somebody that can help you. Look, uh, I need help to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look, uh, I dropped my phone and I can't find my charger. Or can you please get me something from the fridge? Okay. Things like, like that. that. Okay. 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 All right. Yeah. How bad is swelling usually? Depends on the procedure. Okay. Uh, everybody does get swelling from whatever surgical procedure is done. Look, during the surgery, you hook up an IV, we give you fluid through your IV. Just from that IV, you're going to get swelling. Oh, okay. It's the body's natural reaction to surgery. It swells. That's how okay. it heals. Most of the swelling from most of the procedures is usually gone in about two to three to four weeks. Oh. All right. If you're doing liposuction, it's a different kind of surgery. Oh. That swelling is usually gone maybe about six to eight weeks later. Oh. Okay. Okay. Is there anything we can do to help um, with the swelling? Yeah. So two things, compression garments. That's why compression garments are so important. Okay. Right. okay. So what happens is compression garments and lymphatic massage. Lymphatic Those massage. are the two main things. Okay. All right. Then there are two pills you can take on our website, on our wish list of things to get before surgery, Arnica and bromelain. Arnica yep. and bromelain. Those also help to reduce bruising and swelling. Okay. So those are the things you can do to reduce swelling. Okay. So to understand swelling, basically you got your arteries and you got your veins and the blood's coming from the artery going to the vein. Okay. The thing that hooks up arteries and veins are these little network of capillaries, little tiny capillaries. <laughs> So when the body is stressed after surgery, the body goes, oh, stress mode, stress mode in preparation for fluid loss, in preparation for blood loss, store up some fluid in case we need it. Uh So in these capillaries, these capillaries become what we call leaky, leaky capillaries. Okay. So the capillaries actually leak fluid from the blood, and that's why you get swelling. Uh, that makes more sense. So the sense. body is holding on to all this fluid in anticipation for blood loss going, okay, if you lose any more blood, we can take the fluid out of the tissue, put it back in the capillaries and make sure everything is okay. Ew, it's, so it's in, a control, in a controlled environment in surgery, we control the blood loss. We give you fluid through your IVs. So every, your body's safe, but your body doesn't quite realize it. It doesn't quite believe it is holding on to this fluid so we use these compression garments. We use this massage. We use the arnica and the bromelain to get the fluid from the tissues back into those leaky capillaries, back into your blood system, back to your kidneys, so you can pee it out. Oh. Holy moly. Like our yeah. body is literally just made to protect us at all times. Yeah, of course. I- that's their job. Otherwise, uh, it wouldn't be good. No. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So crazy to think. Oh my gosh. Yeah. What about a uh, diet after? Yeah. So uh, yeah, we get that all the time. Mm-hmm. So I have had some patients, Oh, Dr. Katzen. Uh, I, I see them post off of course. I I'm not eating because I don't want to ruin my results. I'm like, what are you thinking? All right. <laughs> you, gotta, you, you gotta think of the body as sort of like a car. Mm-hmm. It needs gasoline to run. Gasoline is food. So you need food to heal. And I have some patients that don't eat right after the surgery and do not heal. Uh-huh. And as soon as we get them on the right eating pattern, you can see them literally within a couple of days start to heal. Okay. Wow. Okay. So after the surgery, and I have a, um, a board certified registered dietitian, part of my practice. She can see all my patients. She makes recommendations to all my patients. So this is not just me as a plastic surgeon sort of winging it. This is the <laughs> science behind it. Yeah. But the majority of my patients typically take about, require 
about 100 grams of protein a day after the surgery. Okay. Okay. So, you know, you're going to Google, Dr. Google, as we call it, <laughs> which is, which has a lot of good information, but you got to remember, I do this every day, 24 seven. Yeah. Uh, so protein, a hundred grams is not going to crash your kidneys. Dr. Google will say, Oh, there's too much protein and you're not going to absorb it. Well, that's not true. Yeah. Your body needs about a hundred grams of protein per day. Now, 100 grams of protein is a lot. A lot of my patients are not hungry after the surgery. Yep. So you gotta, I tell my patients, you gotta think of protein and food like as more important, perhaps, as your antibiotics. I don't uh, care if you're hungry. I don't care if you don't want it. You have to get that protein in to heal. Wow. Otherwise, it's not gonna heal. Okay. So the way most of my patients get in the protein is protein drinks, protein shakes. Yep. Yes. Yep. They're easy on the tummy. They're easy to digest. The stomach is sitting there like a sponge. Please feed me. So we get it in as protein drinks, protein sources. Then usually after maybe like a week, five days to a week, then patients are able to eat more solid food. But it's every patient's a little bit different. But as long as you get in those 100 grams of protein by protein shakes, protein drinks for the first couple of weeks, you'll be good. Yeah. And yeah. our I mean, our favorite protein is devotion nutrition yeah. i just have to sh put that in there it is great it is and it's like 30 grams no it's 20 20 grams of protein per scoop per scoop uh, yeah so it's high so, protein really great yeah we'll make sure we get that on our website and you know there are a lot of different patients with a lot of different dietary needs out there yeah, yeah. we have some patients who are vegetarian yep so there are protein drinks, which are pure vegan, which yep. we can get to patients. So every gluten-free one, I saw a patient today, she is gluten-free and we have to have a special diet for her. So your dietary requirements shouldn't restrict the protein that you're taking post -op. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. The protein is post-operatively, I would say, is probably the most important thing you can do for yourself. Okay. Got to get that protein. Have you I've even had patients over the years who I had to give an appetite stimulant oh. to get them to eat after the surgery. Wow. Like, I'm not hungry. I'm not going to eat. I'm like, you got to eat. Got to eat. And yeah, so we give them the appetite stimulants just to get them going. Okay. Like, oh my gotta goodness. Eat. You got to eat. Yeah. yeah. Have you noticed any difference for healing when it comes to having like being a vegan versus um, not? Uh, no, I okay. haven't really seen that. Okay. Um, I, uh, in terms of the diets, it's pretty much the same. I have seen, and other surgeons and plastic surgeons have seen differences in healing as to the type of gastric surgery you've had. Okay. Mm. okay. So, so people with duodenal switch, in my opinion, have the poorest healing. Oh. They usually have a lot of dumping issues, a lot of malabsorption issues. In my opinion, the patients that heal up the best are the sleeve patients. Whoop, whoop. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so the Rue and Y patients sort of fall in between that, but the duodenal switch patients are notorious for poor healing, dumping, malabsorption, poor vitamins, anemia, which all go against wound healing. Oh, okay. Sleeve patients, again, seem to do the best. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Seriously. So if somebody is traveling... So say like, cause we're in Oregon and yeah. say we traveled and we wanted to have surgery done by you. What yeah. does that look like? Yeah. So we have a lot of out of town patients. Okay. I would say about probably about 60% of my patients wow. are out of state. Okay. Wow. Okay. All right. And we probably of that 60%, I would say 20% are out of the country. Wow. Well, that's awesome. So we got them from all over the place. Okay. So we're very used to dealing with patients from out of state and out of country. So it depends on your procedure as to how long you're going to be required to stay in LA. Okay. okay. Typically for like a tummy tuck or a body lift, you're looking to stay in LA for about 10 days to two weeks. Okay. okay Post-operatively. Okay. That's to make sure you're healing up okay. Make sure you're on the right track. Make sure the swelling is going down. Ideally, get rid of all the drains before you travel home. Okay. okay. It's about 10 days, 14 days in LA. And then when you return home, the follow-ups are typically done, either traditionally if you want through the phone 
or as we're doing the beauty of <laughs> video in 2022. Yeah. Look, we can do WhatsApp. I was on WhatsApp this morning already with a guy in London. Okay. Nice. Wow. We can do Zoom. We can do Skype and we can do FaceTime. Wow. You know, with all those things at hand, there's no excuse why we can't do things uh, visually. Perfect. Oh, that's awesome. So 10 Yay. to 14 days, Cal. I can, yeah. I think that I could handle that. I think if we do it, we need to just do it together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll just take a third person and they can just be our yeah. little assistant we'll for the two rent weeks. We'll just an Airbnb for two weeks. Yeah. And we'll come over and hang out with Dr. Katzen. Yeah. <laughs> Get it done. Yeah. <laughs> so the other aspect is money. How do you, so what does it look like? Do you, do most people take a loan out? Is there a, like, how do you handle that? Because obviously most people don't have, you know, thousands of dollars of just, to just in their bank account yeah. or cash. So how yeah. does that work? Yeah. So every plastic surgeon is different. So, you know, um, every plastic surgeon is different for a multitude of reasons. One, their experience two, their practice location, three, the length of the surgery. Maybe they're doing it in a surgery center. Maybe they're doing it in their office. Maybe they're doing it in a hospital. Okay. So there are all these ranges of prices. Okay. It's like saying, what's the cost of a car? Well, the cost of a, a Ford in Oklahoma City is going to be different than a Ferrari here in Beverly Hills. Yes. Right. Different costs. So costs are different across the board. Okay. Number two, in terms of how do people come up with the money, there are a variety of ways. Some patients have been saving for years. There are other, uh, sometimes it's covered by insurance. Sometimes it's partially covered by insurance. And then a third way, or another way is we have third parties, which actually lend the money to you as the patient. One company we deal with uh, on a daily basis is called Care Credit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if your care credit is good, you go to Care Credit and you go, I need the surgery with Dr. Katzen. Okay. It costs this much. They will figure out your rate, your interest rate. Okay. And then they lend you the money and then care credit pays me Dr. Katzen. Nice. Huh. Okay. Yes. So Another it gives you an way, option. Yeah. Absolutely. Another way to do it, and I would highly encourage this, if your credit is good, go on the internet. <laughs> go find yourself a good credit card with 0% interest over a year or two years. Okay. Your credit cards out there just mm -hmm. like that. 0% interest. Yep. Okay. Do your surgery. And then over the next year, two years, pay down that credit card as much as, as you can. Okay. So that way there's no interest. Yeah. You don't owe the credit any interest. You don't owe the credit cards any interest, but you have to be really conscientious on paying down that credit card. I love okay. it. That's a smart yeah. way. Yeah. I have to blow my nose. Okay. Because my that. nose is very stuffed right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. Uh, I'll take you a guys pause. Keep talking. Keep talking. Okay. I do have a question about drains because I did hear you talk about that. Yeah. So, um, oh, you're going to, we'll wait. We'll Let's wait. Let me get questions. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. No, they're doing something too. Yeah. Um, how is she's a week out? Yeah. Yeah. We can remove that. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, what are you removing? <laughs> yeah. We're going to wait so for question. Question. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. I'm back. I'm back. I just had to blow my nose. Okay. So, so drains, one, what are they for and when do they get to come out? <laughs> yeah, good question. So drains, well, why do we use them? Well, you got to imagine the history of surgery. So we're doing surgery, doing surgery, and we have a problem. So we invent something to fix it. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, what did we invent to fix it? A drain. Okay. So why do we have drains? Well, the problem was, is when we open up an area like the tummy or the arms or the thigh or whatever the area is, your body is engineered, designed, created, whatever you wish to close that area, to glue that area back down. Okay. So if I open up that area, as soon as that area is open, your body is like, fix it, fix it, fix it. How does it fix it? Well, it fixes it by secreting this thing called serous fluid, S E R. O U S. Okay. Not serious fluid, but serious without the eye. Serious fluid. Okay. All right. Serious fluid basically is crazy, is like your body's crazy glue. Okay. Okay. So it makes this crazy glue to stick things down. So if you ever cut yourself and you have a little skin flap and the skin flap is flapping and you stick it back down, within a couple of days, it's going to get stuck down and heal. Mm -hmm. Well, how does it do that? 
it's this serous fluid, okay? Again, it's part of these capillaries, you know, the capillaries sending out, oh, we've been injured, secrete this stuff, it secretes serous fluid, okay. So the problem is if you've ever used crazy glue, and if you've ever used too much crazy glue, you'll realize that the edges don't stick together because you use too much crazy glue. Okay. So if you're trying to stick two things together, you should use a tiny drop of crazy glue, not like a whole tablespoon because the whole thing won't stick together. Got it. Oh. So what the body does in these large cavities, I'm opening up the whole abdomen, the whole thigh, the whole body, your body makes too much crazy glue oh. so that the edges underneath float away from each other and do not heal. Oh, and then your body makes a little, okay, we got all this serous fluid, make a little wall around it. Then it becomes not a serious fluid. It becomes a seroma, a collection of serous fluid, a ball of fluid, a water balloon, if you will. Uh -huh. And then you got to stick a needle in it and drain it. Okay. Oh. All right. So to minimize that whole yeah. thing, we put drains in. Okay. So drains are constantly sucking out that fluid so your body doesn't build up too much super glue in there. Oh, okay. that makes Another sense. thing it does is it sucks out some of the residual blood, which may collect after these surgeries. So the majority of the time it's for the serous fluid. So it helps things to stick, stick down. So that's why we use them. Okay. We use them in the, or I use them always in the tummy tuck. I use them always in the body lift, always in the thigh lift, usually not in the breast augmentation because I don't want to get the breast implants infected. I don't uh, need them in the arms anymore. And I still use them on the face lifts and the neck lifts. Okay. Right. Depending on the amount of fluid coming out determines when we take them out. Okay. So it's not a when question. It's a how much fluid is coming out okay. kind of question. Okay. So my patients are like, okay, you know, it's day 10. I'm ready to get my drains out. Well, what's, what's it putting out? Okay. If it's not putting out, if it's putting out minimal fluid, we're going to take it out. If it's putting out too much fluid, it's got to stay in. Ah, that makes sense. That makes way more so, sense now. Yeah. yeah. I like so your analogies. All, <laughs> seriously. Yes. Yeah, so not all drains come out at day 14. Okay. Because look, everyone's different. Okay. It really depends on how much fluid is being produced. Okay. Right. So say you travel to you and um, it's ah, day 14 yeah. and yeah. you're still secreting fluid. How do you yeah. handle that? Yeah. So again, it's, it's every patient's different. Yeah. So it, then it becomes a, it's up to you kind of question. Okay. Right. So options. All right. So option number one, can you stay later in LA? Okay. Usually the answer is no, I have to get home, Airbnb. Yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you fly home with the drain or you drive home with the drain or sorry, you are being driven home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to be careful. There. Yeah. So you go home with the drain. Then you're going to follow up with me maybe every 48, maybe every 72, maybe 96 hours on what that drain is doing. You're okay. going to write down what the drain is putting out. You're going to take a little picture of us, send it to us. And then we'll look at how much fluid is being put out and then say, okay, today's the day to take the drain out. Okay. Okay. And then over the Skype, over the Zoom, WhatsApp, FaceTime, whatever you wish, we will take the drain out together. Oh, um, I love to ask that. <laughs> yeah. So um, you do not have to be a board certified Beverly Hills class surgeon. You do <laughs> not have to be a doctor. You don't have to be a nurse. You can take out your own drains very successful. I've never, ever, ever had a problem with drain removal of my patients taking their own drains out. Okay. We drew it over the visual here to make sure there are not problems. It's so easy. Okay. Oh, good. And, Cause yeah. I was like super nervous about that part. Cause I yeah. see that all the yeah. time that girls are like, yeah, we just took it out myself. And I'm like, mm -hmm, I don't know. See? Exactly. You'll be able to do it. I, I guarantee it. Other options are you uh, involve your local doctor, which is highly unnecessary. Uh, another option is some patients, they come back down to LA for drain removal, kind of a big effort, but that can be done too. Gotcha. Okay. So okay. It just depends on patient comfort level and what you feel you can do. But okay. Medically, you can take out your own drugs. Okay. Nice. And All you were right. talking about driving. So when can someone start driving? 
Yeah, it depends on the procedure again. Okay. All right. So from a tummy tuck, usually you're looking at about two to three weeks. Okay. okay. From a body lift, maybe again, it's going to be about two to three to maybe four weeks. Okay. Thigh lift, you're on the accelerator, you're on the brake. Mm-hmm. I hope. All right. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that's three or four weeks. All okay. right. The arms, again, arms on the steering wheel, no driving with your knees. Uh, that's looking probably like about two to three weeks. Okay. Facelift usually is at about about a week, about ten days. And why yeah. why do you restrict the driving? Like, I know that like with the legs it makes sense and the arms, but the the middle part. Yeah, with the tummy it's the position in the seat. Okay, you know you don't want to be too uncomfortable. And then God forbid if there's some crazy person on the road that's about to hit you. You don't want your brain to think, oh, I don't want to swerve because I'm going to hurt my tummy or it's going to hurt if I do that movement. Okay. Your brain's got to be, you know, really quick to say, OK, swerve left, right or center or do whatever you got to okay. do. All so right. be yeah. comfortable, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. OK. Exactly. And you obviously know, off of the pain meds. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's what I was just going to mention. You don't want to be all drugged up on the road and uh, fighting traffic. Yeah, yeah let's yeah. not do that. Let's not yeah. at all. In LA, it's all about the traffic. <laughs> I believe that. I yes, believe that. My yes. goodness. I've been in LA once. It mm-hmm. was last November after the retreat. And uh, my lovely boyfriend drove because I don't like I was super nervous and it was crazy. It yeah. was crazy traffic. I was like, I've never seen traffic like this. Yeah, I made Eric drive too. Yeah. I was like, nope, not doing it. No. <laughs> Lucky you got out alive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Well, we were driving from universe. Uh, yeah, San Diego. See, uh, no, from. Vegas. Why am I Universal blanking? Disneyland? Universal Studios, Universal Studios, Studios. to yeah. back to Disneyland. Um, so, um, yeah, so we went through through LA. Yeah, gotcha. Major traffic, eight lane traffic, uh, eight lanes one way. I know that road. Yep. Yes, <laughs> yes, it was. And Zach is a very good driver. He drives for a living. But I was just like. You're, you're such a nerd. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So we've heard from plastic surgeons before about like uh, nicotine, like smoking. It's yes. not allowed. Yeah. What's going on? Are you the same way or what's going on with that? Yeah. So basically, remember the arteries and the veins and the little capillaries? Yes. Yeah. So those little capillaries are very sensitive. There are millions and millions of them throughout your entire body. But those little capillaries are responsive to nicotine. Okay. Okay. And where the capillaries connect to the veins, those little veins are also very sensitive to nicotine. Gotcha. And what nicotine does is it causes the capillaries and the veins to constrict, to clamp down. Mm -hmm. Okay. The arteries pumping, pumping, pumping oxygen along. And when it hits the capillaries, the capillaries are shut down, the veins are shut down. So the tissue that it's being sent to does not receive oxygen. Oh. And that's what nicotine does. That's what gives you that high. Because Uh. blood is being diverted from your intestines and things that are non-essential and being driven to your brain and your heart. So that's why you get that artificial high. Okay. Okay. Uh. So nicotine, very, very bad. Very, right. very bad. We had a patient even this weekend who we canceled because, oh, I don't smoke cigarettes. I'm like, okay, do you vape? Yeah, I vape all the time. Vaping is, in fact, worse than smoking. Vaping has about 200 times more nicotine than cigarette smoke. Holy so shit. if you're vaping, i rather you smoke, okay? Uh-huh. That's how bad it is, okay? Oh, my God. I had no idea. Yeah. Oh, so, shit. Don't do nicotine. And I've had some patients, oh, Dr. Katz, and I don't smoke. I'm like, okay, great. I'm doing the nicotine patch. Like, <laughs> yeah. So same problem. It's the nicotine. So okay. cigarettes are really bad. Don't do it. It causes cancer. You're going to die from cigarette smoking. Every every day, somebody, many, many people die from cigarette smoke. Yeah. yeah. Don't smoke. It's got carcinogens in it. And it also has the nicotine. But for plastic surgeons, we're concerned about patients' lives too. Yeah, so don't smoke carcinogens. But we're, in fact, maybe perhaps more concerned about the nicotine in cigarettes than the tar and the carcinogens. Okay. okay? So in my rule is if you smoke, you've got to be smoke-free for four, not weeks, but months. There you go. Okay? Wow. And if you've quit smoking for four months, 
you might as well quit smoking forever for the rest of your life. Yes. 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 100%. And my saying, my impetus, my suggestion, my token coupon for patients is if you quit smoking and any weight you gain from your smoking cessation, quitting smoking, I will take off for free during your procedure. Oh, that's sweet. That's okay. awesome. You, you got to quit smoking. Yeah. So smoking is like the worst thing you can do. So yeah. One of the worst things you can do. I got to preface that. Yes. Since we're being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> what about if you smoke weed? Yes. I know that oh, we're yeah. going to get now this that, question. Yeah. Now that's an interesting question. Now that's, that's a three prongs approach. Okay. So marijuana state of California is legal. Yes. All right. So Marijuana, any kind of smoke, whatever kind of smoke it is, all right, is not good for your lungs. So that's not good for the general anesthesia and the breathing machine you're going to be on. Okay. So any kind of smoke is going to increase your chances of post-operative complications okay. like pneumonia, like even blood clots. So okay. the smoking is not good. Okay. So again, quit, quit. Now, that is smoking marijuana. Now, marijuana does have a couple of other benefits to us. One, remember we talked about eating postoperatively? Yes. Okay. So marijuana can stimulate mm -hmm. appetite. Yes. Mm -hmm. So on some of my patients, I will tell them, look, I want you to eat the gummies because they're going to help you eat. Mm. And then the other thing the gummies can do as can control some of the anxiety and the pain after the surgery. Right. So if you smoke, I suggest stop smoking for months. Okay. But if you need that, you can do the edibles. And even after the surgeries, I may encourage the edibles if you had the edibles before, okay, <laughs> for pain control and appetite stimulation. Okay. Oh, wow. That's, that's good a, to know. That's a lot of information. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, don't start gummies after surgery. <laughs> I mean, but if you are taking it before surgery, uh, gummies can potentially help after the surgery. Well, and they help you sleep too. Yeah. Yeah, true. So yeah. True. it gets you to rest mm -hmm. after. Yeah. And you need yeah. your sleep. Sleep is like the biggest thing that helps you heal too. Exactly. So yeah. I think sleep is underrated overall, mm -hmm. uh, whether you've had surgery or not. And I think more and more studies show that, look, you know, you really need sleep every day, undisturbed sleep, restful sleep. Your body needs that downtime to heal all the damage you've done throughout mm -hmm. the day. And then if you exercise all that tissue damage, it needs to repair that. Yeah. How much sleep do you believe that people need a night? Uh, I think it's variable. And as okay. you age, you need less sleep. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. You know, if you think about babies, you know, they're sleeping all the time. Yeah. If you think about, you know, people in their eighties and nineties, they may only sleep a couple hours. So it, it's a spectrum. So, you know, I think your body will tell you, look, I'm tired. Well, go sleep more. Okay. But I think the range is probably between four and eight hours. Okay. I think that's probably the range for our audience. So again, your body will tell you, and maybe you just ran a marathon or maybe you hit the gym really hard and you're tired, go to sleep. No harm, no foul. Your body's telling you I need recovery. So give it, you know, either a power nap, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or maybe another hour of sleep. Okay. Yeah. All yeah, right. Stop yeah. fighting sleep, everybody. I know. I did not <laughs> fight it yesterday. So we just flew in from San Diego yesterday. Yeah. And I got back to my boyfriend's house and I was like, I'm so tired. And so I laid down and he actually laid down with me, which is weird because he does not nap. No, he doesn't. And we were watching a movie and we just po both passed out for like three hours and they had to wake me up and they're like, dinner's ready. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I must have needed some sleep. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Uh Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other questions that you had? No, I think we've covered a lot of them. I mean, yeah. I think the biggest deal is for this community is that they're just worried that like it's a it's for vain 
you know, mm-hmm. of what people, of what think. people think. Yeah. And really like we're trying to showcase like, Hey, it's not like, it's part of the process kind of like, you know, if you yeah. want a start to finish, cause I, I think that's what's pushed me over the edge is one meeting like doctors like you and understanding like how it works. And then the fact of like, yeah, damn it. I want that reset button. And that, that includes the skin. Yeah. You know, like I know my food habits now, like I know how to drink my water, eat my protein. And I want to be able to be what it, what it should have been in the first place. Yeah. You know, if I was taught this at 10, 12, 15, 16 years yeah. old. Yeah. And you're also seven years out. So you have a little mm-hmm. bit different headspace. Yeah. Then, yeah. well, almost seven years, but. We I got two more weeks left. Two more hit weeks. My seven year post op. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think being three years post op, like mm-hmm. it's still like I'm still on the, the fence. The fence, and I feel like I think where I'm not like over the edge yet is that I still have more I want to do. So I mm-hmm. still want because I did have some regain. So I would like to get a handle on exactly why I regained, what food I need to not not completely cut out, but like limit limit. And then also get fit as far as like strong, not so much the weight loss aspect Mm -hmm. of it, but gaining that muscle. Like you were, like you were saying, Dr. Katz and like, you want to be, have more muscle gain before you have surgery. So I want to get strong. I want to do that and have Mm -hmm. a handle on it. So when I am able to go back to the gym, which is my next question, um, I want to be able to like just get back into my routine. Right. Just of doing hop back it. in. Yeah, exactly. So when do you suggest that people go back to like the gym? Because that is a harder thing. Yeah. So everybody's different. Every yes. procedure is different. So usually, uh, and it's gradual, you know, you're doing your gym routine now. After the surgery, you're not just going to say at Tuesday at 3 p.m., okay, I'm going to hit the gym the way I used to. It's going to be gradual. Okay. Everybody is different. So typically, let's take the tummy tuck, for instance. Yes. You do your tummy tuck. Um, maybe about 10 days, two weeks out, the drains will be removed. Maybe like a month, six weeks later, a lot of the swelling will be gone. If everything is healing right, usually like at about a month, I'll have you go back into light exercise. Okay. Maybe you're walking around the neighborhood, maybe a little stationary bike, maybe a little bit of an elliptical. Then maybe at about two months, I'll have you hit it even harder. Maybe some resistance and weights and stuff like that. And then maybe at about six months, eight months, then I'll have you do core work like sit-ups and obliques and to hit that area of surgery. Okay. Oh, it's a process. It is a process. process. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like a light switch where boom, okay, you know, I'm ready to go now. Eh, Everyone's different. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's like an airplane taking off. It's sort of a slow... And then you're back to normal. Yeah, because a lot of exercises that you do, you have to like taking the tummy tuck it, for an example, mm-hmm. you have you use your core to yeah, do most absolutely. exercises. Yeah. So absolutely. that would be I, I didn't even think about that until you said it. And now I'm like, oh, that well, makes so much sense. And me and you love to yeah. do full body exercises. Yeah, I'm a full body <laughs> exercise yeah, so person. It would take a while for us to get right back into our routine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you really easy. do want to be top physical for yeah. yourself. So, so for full body after uh, area of plastic surgery, I would suggest you isolate uh, areas that have not had surgery. So if you're okay. full body, maybe we do the tummy tuck. And after the tummy tuck, I still have you maybe at about two or three weeks, focus on arms and legs. Okay. Okay. So you can still do that. And okay. then maybe focus on arms and chest and back. Okay. okay. Just try to eliminate the core, eliminate the area that's had surgery. Okay. Maybe do a high lift and two or three weeks out, I'm still letting you do upper body stuff, maybe resistance training, uh, weights on the arms and the chest and the back. Okay. And do you, I remembered my, one of my main questions and I forgot it for a second there was, do you transfer any fat anywhere? Oh yeah. All the time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So it really depends again on the patient. Okay. Not, not me. I'm here to basically within reason, yeah. make what you want. Okay. Right. So typically areas that we transfer the fat to while the buttocks are very, very common. Uh, we call it a Brazilian butt lift. Mm-hmm. Why? Because we're putting fat in the butt. And when we put fat in the butt, it lifts the butt. Okay. Oh. Okay. And there's some debate, but um, most of these procedures originated in Brazil. 
So huh? that's why we call it the Brazilian butt lift. That makes sense. Okay. So we inject it into the buttock. A lot of the time we're injecting fat into the breast. Okay. Okay. Breast augmentation, fat transfer. Okay. okay. We can inject it into the back of the hands to make the hands look rejuvenated. Older patients, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, we lose the fat on the back of the hands. Okay. So we're injecting fat into the back of the hands. A lot of the time we're injecting fat into the face. When you lose weight, you look at your driver's license before weight loss and after weight loss, yep. you've lost all the fat in the face. Yep. Or a lot of the fat. A lot yeah. of it, a lot of it, yeah. Yeah. So we take the fat from, otherwise we'd be throwing it away and we go green, we recycle and we transplant it back into the face. Wow. So, go ahead. So those are the most common areas that we inject. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. So um, I know we're going to get this question is, so say you do the fat transfer done, looks amazing, but then you're released to work out six months later and will you lose any of that? Yeah. Really good question. Okay. So back to the capillaries, Ooh, capillaries again. Yeah. All right. So the capillaries are very, very smart. All right. So we take the fat out, we put it on the back table I strain it. That means I get the really good fat, the quality fat. I wash it with antibiotics on the back table in the operating room. Holy shit. Okay. So that's on the back table. It's been taken out of your body and on the back table. So technically I'm a transplant surgeon because I'm transplanting. I'm taking it out of your body and then transplanting it to a different part of your body. Okay. okay. So I take the fat out typically from the tummy, inner thigh, et cetera. And then I transplant it back into the buttocks or the breast or the face or the hands. And again, those capillaries, I put a piece of fat transplanted from the buttock there. That new piece of fat sends out a little message to the capillary. Help me, help me. I've just been transplanted. Send me some blood. Okay. So the capillary is very smart. It goes, and we don't really know exactly how it does, but through a process called angiogenesis, okay? That's basically recreation of new blood supply. Within 72 hours, it's made new blood supply to that new transplanted piece of fat. Oh, okay. How it does that, nobody really knows, but that's what it does. Okay. okay. So all those little balls of fat have these brand new blood vessels supplying blood to the transplanted fat. So now you go and exercise mm -hmm. and you lose weight. The older blood, sorry, the older fat in your body is like, oh, I don't have much blood supply and that fat cell shrinks. Okay. Okay. The newly transplanted fat cell to your buttock, to your breast, to your face has a brand new blood supply. It's resistant to your exercise. So that little blood cell is supplying that fat cell and they're all really happy because everything is brand new and really young. So it's resistant to that fat reduction. To that oh. weight loss. That's a good one. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. And how long oh. does that stay like that? Yeah. Good question. Uh, probably about eight to 10 years. Oh, about okay. Eight to 10 years. Yeah, okay. So a good amount of time. And the way I, the way I do, everyone's different. Okay. And you know, on the internet, you'll hear a wide variety of range of how much fat survives. Yeah. So the way I do it, back table, strain it, wash it and re-inject it with these cannulas 80% of the fat that I transplant lives. Nice. Okay. Okay. Some plastic surgeons, maybe it's only 10%, 50%, but there's a wide range because everyone does it a little bit differently. Wow. Yeah. My brain yeah. is like blown right now. Blown. I know. With it's all of the information. Cool. Seriously. Oh my goodness. And then with the breast implants, is yeah. it true that you still have to get those like redone every 10 years? No. Okay. Good question. It's again, one of those urban myths, urban legends. It's, it's not true. Okay. okay. Why? Well, the implants now, and even the implants 10, 20 years ago were better than the implants we were making in the 1960s. Okay. Makes sense. So most ethical plastic surgeons will tell you if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Okay. So that means if you're not having any problems with the implant, leave it alone. Okay. okay. So problems with the implant scarring, maybe one side's way up and one side's out the other side. So asymmetry mm -hmm. capsular contracture, scar tissue around the implant. Maybe they're too big. Maybe they're too small. 
those are the most common reasons why we're changing out the implant. Okay. Uh, exceedingly rare that the implant bursts or breaks, but if it bursts or breaks, then it should be replaced. Yeah. But not the every seven to 10 years you need to get it changed. Okay. That's an urban myth uh, that um, um, it should be dispelled. You know, you do not need the implants changed. Back. Awesome. Because I know I was like nervous about that because like what yeah. I want to do is like a the mommy makeover, basically like the tummy yeah. and the boobs. But yeah. like, I don't know if I want to do like just a lift or if I actually want implants or not. So like that was definitely a, a deciding factor. Yeah. So. Yeah. So with that exact question, what you want to do is you want to lift up the breast, And if you're happy with that amount of volume, then you probably do not need an implant. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. okay. So then that would just be a lift. That'd be a lift. That'd just be a lift. Okay. So, so typically when we're doing just a lift, when I do a lift, the amount of breast tissue I take out is not much. It's like between a teaspoon and a tablespoon from each breast. Wow. Not much. Okay. Now, when I'm doing a breast reduction, sometimes I'm taking out three to five pounds on each breast. Yeah. That's different. That's, different. That's a reduction. Breast is too big. I want them, patient wants them smaller. We make them small. Okay. Okay. So if you lift up the breast and you're happy with the volume, maybe we just do a lift. Okay. If you lift up the breast and you're like, eh, I want more fullness. Mm-hmm. I want more cleavage. I want larger breasts. I want a better shape of the breast. Yeah. Then maybe we need to do the lift and the implant. Okay. Okay. And then last question for me is nipples and belly buttons. Yes. And yes. <laughs> we all have them. Yes. So with the nipples. Well, we... <laughs> that's interesting. Yes. I've, I've had some patients who want them off and we take them off too. Okay. That's, um, body modification surgery. Oh, gotcha. So, okay. Gotcha. So in Beverly Hills, we see and do everything. Yeah. We see it all. <laughs> but in general, usually, yes, yes. So with the, with the nipple, 99% of the time when we're doing breast lifts and breast reductions, the nipple stays on, stays attached. Okay. 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 It's exceedingly rare that we take the nipple off and then transplant it back to the body. Okay. Male and female patients. Okay. Reason being we take the nipple off is maybe the nipple is very, very low. Like I've had some patients where the breast, the nipple actually hangs below the belt line. That's oh, how no. low they go. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. So in cases like that, because of blood supply, you've got to take the nipple off mm-hmm. and put it back on. Okay. okay. Maybe the patient's a heavy smoker. For blood supply, you've got to take the nipple off, put it back on as a skin graft. Maybe during the surgery, the nipple turns purple, doesn't look good, and we've got to take them off and put them back as a skin graft. Okay. But 99% of the time, the nipple stays on and we're just moving things around. Oh, I like that. So, All right. Okay. Nipple, nipple sensation usually is intact after the surgery. Okay. If you don't have nipple sensation before surgery, it's unlikely you're going to gain it after the surgery. Okay. But usually nipple sensation is intact. Okay. Areola, very, very common question. Pigmented tissue around the nipple. Most men and women want the areola smaller. Uh-huh. So typically we're making the areola smaller. Okay. Uh-huh. 99% of the time we're making them circles. Okay. But I have a couple of requests and I've done it where we make them heart shapes. <laughs> so, yeah. I make them heart shaped, but I won't do stars because of blood supply. But this is Beverly Hills. We see all kinds That's of stuff. That's amazing. Oh my that God. is really cool. I do I want heart hearted nipples. <laughs> Do I want that? Um, yeah, that's up to you. Um, <laughs> belly buttons, belly buttons, very, very important. Yes. You know, some general surgeons and even plastic surgeons will say, ah, belly button, you don't need them. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen a tummy without a belly button. It looks very alien. In fact, there was a TV show, mm-hmm. Kyle XY. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He was alien, and you could tell he was an alien because he didn't have a belly button. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, I think belly buttons are very important. It provides the human eye a visual landmark as to where the tummy starts and where it ends. So I spend a lot of time making the belly button, getting it in the right place. Okay. So belly buttons, yes, you get one. Yes, it's important. Typically, um, they get reestablished, move to a better spot during the tummy tuck and the body lift. Many belly buttons are sad face belly buttons. At the end of our surgery, we make them vertical belly buttons 
or round belly buttons, depending on what everything looks like. Yes. That's what I want. I know. I want mine's a sad belly button. Like it, let's make it vertical. Yeah, well, it's funny because right. like for oh. mine, it's like start now. It's starting to become a little sad. Yeah. A little sad because I'm working out more. So like everything is starting to get a little saggier in, the, yeah. in that area. Yeah. So I was exactly. Like, Damn it. I have a sad belly button. So my most important question is if where does everybody find you? Yeah. If they want to talk oh, to yeah. you and get a consult or yeah. come and see you, where do they find you? So we're all over the Internet. But the easiest thing to do, pick up the phone. 310-859-7770. Again, 310-859-7770. But if you just Google my name, Timothy, T-I-M-O-T-H-Y, Katzen, K-A-T-Z-E-N, M-D, you'll find me. If Perfect. you can't remember any of that, just Google Dr. Katzen. I'm the only board certified plastic surgeon with that oh, name. Nice. Wow. But awesome. Nice. So K-A-T-Z and uh, we have three offices, Beverly Hills, um, Las Vegas, where I was this past weekend, and then Dubai. So any of those offices, come visit. We can get you all fixed up. Wow. And we will have all that linked below yes. in the description. Mm-hmm. So we are super like this was a great episode. Thank yeah. you so much yeah. for explaining everything in such a like layman's turn. Yeah. So yeah. we can understand. So thanks for having me. And uh, I'd love to come back and we can talk about everything as we did, or we can dial it down to, well, let's talk about arm lifts today and yes. make a really focused session on one surgery. You know, whatever, whatever you ladies want to do. Oh, yeah. Yay. We're so excited. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Katzen, for being yeah. here. And um, as thanks always, of course, and as always, remember, go over to our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash forward slash OSLP <laughs> um, and sign up to support us, get your, get into the support group. Um, mm-hmm. And then also go over to YouTube and like, and subscribe and ring that little bell. Ring that bell, man. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Cause if you're just listening to this, you will want to go over and watch the video yes, you do. because Dr. Katzen is like very good at explaining where everything is and what everything is. Yeah. It's yeah. And he talks fantastic. with his hands. So yes. you need to see it. <laughs> you need to watch it. <laughs> All right. We love you guys. And we will see you next time. Bye.